Have you ever thought about what it would take to become a flight nurse or a flight medic and fly on a medevac helicopter? You know, flying to emergency scenes and rushing to the aid of someone on their worst of days. Hop aboard the helicopter with me today as I interview a seasoned professional with over 20 years of emergency medical experience. And uh, runway seven clear for takeoff, right turn southwest bound approved. Wind 170 at seven, altimeter 3019, remain west of 1836. Today aboard the aircraft, I have a very good friend that I've known for a little over 10 years now. She is a flight nurse, and we have worked countless motor vehicle accidents, burned victims, shooting victims together over the years. You know, back when I was a ground based paramedic on an ambulance in rural Virginia. Of course, nobody ever wants to be in a situation needing to be airlifted to a specialty trauma center or a cardiac center. But if you are in this need, Jody is exactly the person that you want to be by your side. She is a person that I would 100% trust my life in her hands. And here now is flight nurse and educator Jody. So how you doing? I am doing amazing. How are you? Uh, this, so this is, uh, as we were chatting before we started the video here, you've obviously been in a helicopter an awful lot, but this is a completely different, you know, just enjoying the scenery. Yeah. For sure. Absolutely. It's so nice to sit back and relax for a hot minute. <laughs> exactly. So why don't you give a little brief history of kind of where you started in flight EMS? So I guess it all started when I was <clears throat> technically 15, man. All right. I, um... You know, I, I did athletic training for the football team in high school, okay. and then um, I, the one, the athletic trainer was a paramedic, and um, super cool chick, she got me into emergency medicine, went into the junior squad, and then at 15 years old, I'll never forget it, I watched my first helicopter land, and it had a big teddy bear on it, it's from DC, it was one of the children's um, helicopters, and okay. I, um, I was like, the, the people, they stepped out of the helicopter, I helped them get from the elevator up to the top floor to take care of them, to get to one of the kids, you know? They were so professional, kind, uh, just people that I, I just couldn't believe that this was a profession. So you fell in love then? Uh, 100%. I mean, at 15 years old, that was it. I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and I just needed to figure out how to get there. After high school, you went military, is that correct? I did, so a little bit of backstory to that. So uh, I, uh, I actually got a softball scholarship my first year, a uh, half a scholarship to go to uh, school. And I went, it was a small school. And um, what happened during that time, I realized that, uh, yeah, we, we didn't grow up with a lot. Uh, we had family, which was the most important, but we didn't grow up with a lot of money. <laughs> right. So looking at how to figure out how to pay that loan back, and it was just half a loan, right? Yeah. Uh, it's going to be virtually impossible. So in order to continue my career, in order to progress, I had to do, to do the military. You had to find a route that was going to pay for school. I did. And not that I did. I, I wanted to join. I loved the military. My father served. My grandfather served. But uh, if I wanted to continue my career in any way short, I had to go into uh, the military. 100%. And you went Air Force, is that correct? I did. So I wanted to, a big guard, never active duty, always guard. And um, they have an a, a air evacuation unit. And uh, found that out at the age of 19. I went in in, um, God, 1999. And um, I, I took my tests. I got, you know, I did everything. I qualified and went in as a flight medic. Okay. Uh, so that's where I got my start, was as a flight medic in 99 with, uh, with the military, West Virginia Air National Guard. Yep. So you've been with them the whole time? Sure have, to this day. Still with them, still serving, not in a flight medic capacity, but more of a critical care air transport nurse now. Um, so I've uh, kind of progressed up and, and really enjoyed it. When I met you was, so obviously, as people know, we are currently in Tampa, Florida, but I met you 10-ish years ago when I was living in Virginia and I was an EMT before I went to paramedic school, and you were one of the flight nurses in the area that I worked with quite regularly. So when, after I got into the military, went to school, did all that stuff, I received my paramedic um, within the hopes of always wanting to fly in a helicopter. Remember, I haven't done any of that yet, so I'm still military, right? Yeah, because at that time you were still fixed wing flight nurse. Still, st yeah, flying is fixed wing. Um, so I went to work as a, as a paramedic, as a, as a firefighter for the city of Winchester, Virginia, and uh, started like really learning true, you know, uh, paramedic stuff. Continued on to become a nurse because in order to get in a helicopter, you have to make yourself very marketable, exactly. Yeah. So 
I went into I went to nursing school because the military could pay for it. Right. And I went right to the ICU, and then I got picked up with PHI in 2004, and I've uh, been flying rotor. I've been flying rotor uh, civilian since then. So you yeah. were with PHI the whole time. Obviously, that's where I met you. Yes. Was it always in the Front Royal base, or did you kind of go to a couple different bases? Uh, so um, I started out in the Winchester base, and then the Winchester a whole base moved to Front Royal. Okay, got and it. And then I flew out of there from 2004 all the way up until 2019. What type of certifications do you currently hold, which I'm sure is kind of a lengthy list? <laughs> Yeah, so whenever you get involved in this type of medicine, it, it, it's much different than being, you know, in, in a hospital setting. You have to think on your feet. So in order to prepare to think on your feet, you know, you have your normal alphabet suit, your ACLS, which right. is your advanced cardiac life support, your PALS, pediatric advanced life support. Of course, your CPR. Everyone has that. But to further your your um, your knowledge, your skills, um, your critical thinking is where you really have to step it up. TPATC is a, is a great course. Um, so we have to become proficient in that. We have to have NRP, which is your neonatal resuscitation. Okay. Um, you know, wh where we fly, sometimes you could you have a bomb that could deliver, you know, that she can't get to a, a hospital that can support that kid. Or you're in a small hospital, a standalone ER that, you know, a 20, uh, let's just say like a 29 week or a 30 week or bomb just delivered. They don't know how to take care of that. Right. They don't have the neonatal, right. you know, NICUs. Yep. You have the perspective of being a paramedic and being a nurse. Yep. Could you kind of describe what's the difference? So someone that you know maybe is either just getting started out in EMS or maybe they're in high school and they don't really know where they want to go. They just know they want to be on a helicopter. What's kind of the difference between flight nurse, flight paramedic? So if you're looking at a perspective for flight nurse, flight paramedic, our skill practice, there is absolutely zero. However, let's start there. Now let's, let's branch back. Let's go okay. backwards. Um, a paramedic brings that unbelievable way to assess patients in the field a way to prioritize, a way from a, to bring an uncontrolled environment back to a controlled sweat setting. Right. A nurse brings the ICU level A lines, drips, uh, balloon pumps, um, fads. They bring that knowledge, and uh, where a paramedic doesn't have that offset because they're used to being in the field. Yes. Do right. you do inner facility? Of course. However, an inner facility on a helicopter is night and day compared to an inner facility in like a CCT you know, ground Agreed. unit. So when you take those two type of uh, uh, educated individuals and you bring them together as a team, they offset one another. Now, the skills remain the same. Right. So when you become a flight provider, paramedic or nurse, when you become that flight provider, you marry each other. Right. And what happens is your skills become as one. So there's no skill that I can do that a paramedic cannot. But that's what the flight portion does, is marry the paramedic and marry the nurse because of the settings and their environment and what they bring together. And it brings two minds together so you're able to yes. problem solve better. Something that you see that maybe your other provider doesn't see yep. or something they see that you don't see. 100%. And you learn and, and you feed off one another and you learn every day because a nurse is not used to the back of an ambulance or a mass casualty scene. Right. And a paramedic sure as the hell isn't used to an ICU <laughs> where you got, you know, 15 drips and everything else going on. Exactly. So, Yep. And multiple providers. So like from the nursing perspective, if you're in an ED or an ICU, you have a team there. You do. Whereas yeah. out in the, the field, especially if you guys were coming out, you might have a couple BLS EMTs to help you, but basically it's your show. You do. Yeah, and you have to think completely outside of the box. Um, you have to do things you've never even thought or done before. Uh, in, in that nursing environment, that hospital has everything provided for you. Someone that's kind of looking into this, I know different programs have different schedules, so it's kind of hard to say you will work this day, this day. But kind of, could you give a general idea? Are you looking at 12-hour shifts, 24-hour shifts, or how does that work? So uh, we do 24-hour shifts, and what we like to do is uh, is one-on, one-off. And uh, it depends on how many people you have. But normally you work two to three potential days a week, 24-hour shifts, okay. mainly just two. So you're looking at 48 hours. That's pretty much what it average out at. Right. Um, and then you kind of do a flow with your other, you know, w with the other um, crew members. So it, it does average out to about 48 hours a week. And, and we like to do 24 hours. There are 12-hour shifts out there. But uh, I think they did a huge study on that. And it was found that you actually don't get as much rest if you're doing 12-hour shifts versus 24s. Okay. Um, there's been some controversy, and I've done both, and I 100% agree with the 24-hour shifts. Yeah, and I know some people that may not have been exposed to EMS be like, oh my God, you're working 24 hours. Right. I've worked 24-hour shifts, and I loved it. It was a lot more convenient. Yeah. 
especially then when you get your, your off days and stuff like that, it gives you kind of the freedom to do things outside of work. It does. And, you know, you're, you're allowed rest periods, right? You, you, you can take naps. And, yeah, uh, of course. And you have a sleeping quarters there. You do, yeah. Yeah, very different than a hospital. If someone, I guess kind of going back to the beginning, if somebody was in high school, in your case, you were in high school, and you saw, hey, I want to do this, and military is one route, what other options, say somebody wanted to go to college directly, maybe they had a scholarship or something, where do they start? Do they go paramedic school and learn the field, or do they go to nursing school, or what do you think? Well, so I need to, to answer that question, I need to back up, uh, because there is a difference between a flight paramedic and a flight nurse, and that one difference is a paycheck, brother. One difference. Actually, we were going to get to that, but go yeah, ahead, we'll cover that now. It has to, it all has to do with, if paramedics need lobbyists to DC, that's the bottom line. However, right. the point of the matter is a flight nurse makes more than a flight paramedic. I disagree with it. I think that we should be equally paid because we equally bust our butts together in an aircraft. Right. I, 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 I feel bad for our medics. However, my recommendation um, is if you have someone that's looking to go the school route first, I, I go for it. If it's paid for, 100% go. Anyway, right. I would go a, a, and get my nursing degree. While you're in school, you can be an EMT. You can go get your EMT on the side. It's not that hard. Yes, and it's only one semester. It's one semester, and you can do that. And then you need to be inside that ambulance running calls and volunteering at the local and learning while you're in nursing school. Now, nursing school and, and EMTs and paramedics, it's two different types of Two education. totally different worlds. But it's okay. Embrace it. Just yeah. embrace it. And then when you're done, when you're finished your career, when you're finished your, your, uh, your college, you need to go into an ICU. You can do ER, ER is great, but an ICU is gonna bring you that critical care factor that an ER can. ER is wonderful, not discrediting it at all. I'm just saying from a flight standpoint. You need the ICU experience. Ah, man, yeah, and we, we've had lots of ER nurses say, oh my, during our new hire academies, right. so that's where I teach at now, they're like, holy cow, where our critical care, our ICU nurses flourish. Right. So, because but, they're already used to all those drips, the different medications, the procedures. Right, right. But I'm not trying to. But ER nurses are phenomenal, fabulous. And we have some of the best flight nurses are ER nurses. So, not well, trying to discredit that. Right. At all. And, I, I, and coming from the outside, obviously, I'm I'm a paramedic, so I know that world. Right. But I would kind of envision, and saying this with respect and love, I would envision an, an ED nurse kind of a combination of they've got some of the skill sets of the field ambulance of the quick triage and treating and they have some of the critical care experience of ICU they're kind of in the middle between the two is that a good assessment yeah, or not? yeah I, I agree I agree yeah because they kind of they get you know for lack of better terms they get the shit show as it's coming in the door right oh yeah and, and they're, they're able to stabilize that get that going and then bring it up to the next level of care where someone's gonna be admitted to the ICU a hundred percent a hundred percent and my, my ER nurses can really acquire can, can can really see eye to eye better with my paramedics versus an ICU nurse. Right, they see better with the nurses because that, that, they, they see it once the yeah. patient's been stabilized. Yeah, it, it's definitely a flip-flop show, but it is, they're both, all three, a paramedic, ER, and ICU, they're phenomenal, phenomenal uh, uh, clinicians. Summarizing it correctly, if you were to give somebody advice, they would go to nursing school, become a flight nurse as the end goal, but also go be an EMT, possibly a paramedic, and get the field experience they can marry the two skill sets. 100%. It's going to make you more marketable, and it's going to have a more of an understanding of what flight medicine is, because it's a hell of a lot more than a fast ride. You have obviously been helicopters and fixed wing. There are civilian fixed wing jobs. Sure. Um, how do those kind of differ? Like, what's the the type of call type between a helicopter that may fly to a scene versus a plane that might do longer distances, or how does that work? So, uh, yeah, just as you stated, so a helicopter is more of your short uh, LZ setup can land just about anywhere as long as it's a safe LZ, you know. Um, so we're, we're doing more of the uh, medevac scenes when it comes to uh, car crashes, um, short distance um, inter-facility transports, but your fixed wing, now you're dealing with more, uh, there's a lot of those out on reservations, longer range transports it saves on fuel, it's faster. Right. Um, problem is you have to have an airport to land at or some sort of runway. Right. Um, so that kind of puts a little bit of hindrance when it comes to transporting that patient. Now you gotta bring an ambulance into play. That, then you gotta transport that patient from the you know airport to that uh, to ER, ICU, wherever they're going. 
You also have to look at when it comes to your oxygen sources. There's different types of medical supplies. You might need more of blood. Because you're going longer more, distance. Yeah, okay. so that's different things to think about. Plus, I'm going to tell you something. Those fixed wing guys are pretty pretty awesome because that's a hell of a long time to be with a sick patient. Yeah, uh, in the you're, back of that you're definitely not doing a 30-minute flight no, usually. No, those guys getting their butt thumped. I mean, they really are. Kind of going back a little bit when we were in Virginia, when I was going through paramedic school, I hung out with you guys on your crew. Because I remember I reached out to you and said, hey, I want to do a couple shifts. And I, yep. I flew with you guys a couple times. Unfortunately, every single time, there was not a damn Nothing. call the entire time I was yeah. there. Yeah. But uh, you worked with me because obviously, I'm, as people know, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a bigger guy. And uh, there's weight restrictions on helicopters due to just the helicopter can only lift so many pounds. And every additional pound that the crew weighs is one less pound of fuel or one less pound that patient can weigh. Sure. What, are there certain requirements at different programs? How does that work if you're a little bit bigger so, individual? Yeah, so it's kind of a, we, we uh, there at one time, uh, one of the programs that I did work for, they wanted to keep you around 215 and under. Okay. Um, however, uh, that's kind of, not, I mean, I don't know how to put this correctly, but it, it kind of went away. Okay. And, um, but I think that we also should be cognizant of it just for the facts that you mentioned. On a hot summer day, we can't lift nearly what we can in the winter um, when it comes to patient weight, you know? Right. So even though my primary aircraft is a 407 that can lift that horse. Right. Um, but, you know, heat plays a factor. You know, fuel plays a factor. Patient weight plays a factor. And you're right. Um, so at the end of the day, I, I don't think it's a more of a program requirement. I think it should be a personal requirement that take it upon yourself. If this is something you want to do, then think beyond just flying in an aircraft. Right. Think about what it takes, what you're flying for and why you're headed out there. Lighter you are within reason, that's more weight than your patient can be, because you do get some, some larger patients at times, too. We do, and, and I'm not saying, you know, need to be like 135. Well, of course, yeah. yeah, yeah I'm just saying, like, be yeah, kind I, I think at the time with air, with, uh, when I was up there and I rode with you guys, I was 225, and oh, I think, yeah. like, the, you, like, kind of wanted to keep people, like, right around 220-ish. Yeah. And I remember you worked with me, and you just kind of put me on, on a crew that was kind of a lighter crew. Yep kind of going back a little bit too, start to finish, like day one of, of training, how long until you could, you know, be flying? Day one of training as just becoming a yeah, brand new nurse? So, yeah, well, I'm brand new, like day one of school. Let's kind of start to do there. Okay. So how long does school take and then how long until you can get into a program? So let's start with a paramedic first. So let's take, so now it, it, back home, it's a two year program, right? right. So let's take two years off the table. Right. What we like after that is a three to five years, uh, it, it more like three, but three to five years of busy, um, a busy uh, paramedic experience when it comes to the back of that ambulance. So Lou Ray would not have counted. <laughs> well, I'm gonna tell you something. That would, that's what uh, I, I disagree. Of course, we did. We did get some crazy stuff, you know. And but. that's the point uh, that I, even though you might be a busy 911 system, I, I do not discredit people. That, that work in, in an atmosphere like Luray, uh, that's royal, because you get some of the sickest of the sick, and you have those patients for a long time. Yeah, like if we were, yeah. up, if we were up in the park, that's yes. an hour we're with that patient. Yeah, so I actually take that off the table, and I don't say, and I did say busy, because that's what you're supposed to say. However, right. I, I don't agree with that. I agree with, um, I agree with three to five years. It, 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 like I need to see where you're coming from, right? Because, man, those rural providers are some of the best people I've ever worked with. Right. Um, so then we went that, and then uh, you can start the application for a nurse. Uh, you could do a two-year route, right? You can get your ADN. That's what I started out with. You right. could be a two-year nurse. And then, again, about three to five years uh, of ICU or ER experience. Okay. Um, we'll take any of that, and then um, you'll go through the interview process. You can definitely apply. We'll do a phone interview first, and then, you know, if everything matches up, then we'll bring you in for a, uh, a in-person physical interview in addition to scenarios. Obviously, you need your pals. You need your ACLS. That's yes. obvious. You yeah. need to, just to be on an ambulance as a paramedic, you're going to need that. So putting right. that aside. Right. But like PTA, uh, was it the uh, pre-hospital trauma life support? Yeah, take all? that stuff. Get, a, get any critical care class you can get your hands on. Because most of us are like a weekend class. Yeah, go in uh, shadow, man. Like uh, if you want to go in and, and shadow like, and this sounds crazy, go to an RT. Because you, I mean, go in because there might be some intubation techniques that you, you know, you're gonna pick yeah. up from them. Yeah. Um, see if your organization, if you have where you can go do with anesthesiologists, can you go do rounds? Some, uh, some hospital, uh, some EMS providers have agreements with hospitals. Go in and do rounds with the physicians. Ask yeah. questions, learn. 
Yeah, that I did is, that as part of my my training, and I loved it because yeah. there's so many different unique things that you see it from a completely different level now. Yeah, because that's going to separate you from, from because you have to think beyond the back of an ambulance now. Right. And it's, you really have to dive into the critical care aspect of what of what's beyond the call. Now, I guess this kind of depends on what program and what geographic area you're in, but do you see more trauma calls or more medical, or is it very? Down here in Florida, I've seen way more trauma than medical, I'll tell you right now. Okay. Uh, but, you know, so it, 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 it really is a 50-50 type of, of um, a day. You, you really don't know. Um, I think it's, uh, I say that we do see a lot more trauma here in Florida, but I think it's seasonal. Uh, we do okay. during uh, spring break. The winter, we get a lot of trauma. Um, but, you know, Is it like vehicle crash trauma or all kinds of stuff? Mainly, you know, people, unfortunately, accidents, people hit by cars. Uh, we have a lot of drownings, uh, which is sad, but yeah. we do a lot of pediatric drownings. What do you think about the 44 so far? Uh, small as shit. <laughs> <laughs> slightly, but, slightly different than what you're used to flying in, right? Uh, I'm just an enjoying not having to do a damn thing. <laughs> My hands, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> just start, start jabbing needles on people. All right. <laughs> But maybe I'll just open up to you. Any other things that you think someone that's looking into this, anything you think they should know about that we can cover? So, yeah, I, actually I do. Um, okay. Um, so if this is something you want to do, don't let anyone tell you that you can't. I come from a very small town, and I knew when I was 15 years old watching that crew land, this is exactly what I wanted to do. However, again, I come from a very small town, and I... Uh, I had uh, some discouragement just because, you know, things like that don't happen to people that come from where I come from, right? Right. And now that was just very, just yeah, nonchalant and type and of... Yeah, and Yeah, but you know what? I never listened to them. I, I listened to my closest friends and my parents. And you can be exactly whatever you want to be. And I know that sounds so generic, but you got to believe in yourself. Right. Don't expect others to believe in you. It's great if they do. My parents did. My best friends did. But believe ultimately in yourself, and you can do whatever you want to do. So this is something you want. Don't let anyone stop you. Ever. That's wonderful advice.